Welcome to the Sunday Sit Down Series. I'm Eddie Ramos, and today we are joined by Don House. Don, thanks for joining us. No, man, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. No doubt about it. So, Don, for those of you tuned in today, former pro boxer, is a pro current pro boxing trainer and a UFC cut man. He's a pioneer in the combat sports world, and we look forward to sharing his story inside the octagon and boxing ring, as well as outside. So, Don, we'll start off. We'll take it back. Where are you from originally? And uh, talk about your childhood. Well, originally from Chicago. I uh, grew up there. So, since I was in a lot of trouble, my mother decided, you know, we better move to Michigan because Chicago was kind of rough for me growing up. You know, I was in fights. I was never in a gang, but I was always in fights. So actually, we moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan. And since I was always in fights in Chicago, I joined the boxing gym, probably when I was about 10 years old. And that's when I ran into Roger Mayweather. And that's when I started my boxing career. I think that was probably, man, like 1972. Okay. Yeah. Good, a good amount of time ago. That's interesting. So literally, yeah. you left Chicago, you go to Michigan, and you happen to run into a gym where the Mayweathers are, are based out of. How did that come about? Exactly. I mean, that's pretty... That's pretty unique. Well, you know, actually, when I left Chicago, my mother was thinking, well, Michigan wants to be a little bit better. If you got fight in you, no matter where you go, fight's going to follow you. So what I did was decide, hey, you know what? Let me just go to a boxing gym. Let me just, you know, curtail some of this energy in the, in, in the fighting where people appreciate me doing fighting. I got kicked out of school for fighting a lot as a kid, and I got my mother beat the crap out of me for it. But when I started winning trophies and, 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 you know, traveling all around the world boxing as a kid, I got trophies. I'm like, well, hell, I'm just going to box for a living. <laughs> this was great. Yeah. So talk to us about that transition. You literally walk into the gym and you learn the sport and then you start competing in it. And, and talk to us about that, those experiences as an amateur. Well, you know, as an amateur, you know, like I said, I fought, I fought with, uh, with the Mayweather the senior, Floyd senior at that time. I didn't, that was no death around, of course. Um, uh, Floyd Senior and Roger. I didn't know Jeff Mayweather until I moved out there to Vegas. Well, until he moved to Vegas. But um, I didn't fight that that much as a kid, but I learned his skills. Uh, my major career started based on I joined the Army. Uh, so that's when I, I fought more and more and more as a, as, as a veteran, as, as, as a soldier. But as a kid, uh, not very many fights. I was still learning the craft from 10 years old, 11, 12, 13. Some little tournaments, but not a lot. Yeah. But when I went to the Army, it's when I honed my skills. Yeah. Very, very interesting. And, and in the Army, you were trained by a renowned trainer. If you want to talk to us about competing at that level and, and what you learned at the time with, within the sport. Uh, well, you know, the Army is all about discipline anyway. You know, I was a little wild kid growing up, even as an amateur boxer. Uh, the streets really wasn't good for me as a, as a fighter because I was just, just one of wild little kids. I learned to fight, but the Army actually taught me the discipline as a person and as a soldier and as a fighter. So I always tell all kids today, if you don't have anything else to do, hey, join the military. I mean, I, can, I can't speak, I can always speak highly of the military. So I hone my skills there. I fought under Kenny Adams. I mean, he's a world renowned, I think he was 84 Olympic assistant coach and 88 Olympic coach boxing. Okay. And, uh, and I fought under him for about three years. Wow, so you went Mayweather's, then you go into a world-renowned trainer in the Army. As you transition throughout the amateurs, you then decided to turn pro at some point. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, due to a few accidents in the military doing training, um, I had like nine knee surgeries on both knees, what, eight on one and one on the other. And due to that, it sort of stopped my career, so I attempted – when I left the Army, because I had like 70-some fights in the Army, uh, about 50 or 60 knockouts, destined to the Olympics, uh, you know, win all Army champions, you go to the Olympics. Unfortunately, due to these knee surgeries, that slowed the career down. I attempted to turn pro when I got out in 85. Uh, I had one pro fight, the knee snapped, and that, that's when I knew the game was over for me. And at that time, obviously, you're coming to the close of what could have been the start of a career that quickly. What was your mindset and, and what really made your next move? I mean, how did you transition 
into saying, you know what, I'm going to be a trainer now. Is that when that transpired well, or? That's, well, you know what, you know, when, when you can't do what you love doing, competition, you know, co competing, training was the last thing on my mind. You know, I said, you know what, screw this crap. I don't want anything to do with boxing because if I can't box, I don't want anything to do with it. Actually, I went uh, back to school. Um, I uh, got a degree in engineering. I started working for a government contractor designing nuclear devices here. I didn't evaluate. We used to have what we call a test site where we actually blew up things. You know, some people call Area 51 where all the aliens. So there's a lot of areas out there we sort of designed nuclear devices and blew things up. And, um, and one day I decided, you know, let me just go back to the gym and hit the bag a few times. And before I know it, I was giving advice to some youngsters and, I had an amateur team, probably about 25 little fighters, and then uh, picked up a couple of pros, and that's how I sort of transitioned back into the boxing. Uh, it's not as fun as boxing, but you know what? I did find a great appreciation for the training because what I taught them, I started seeing were a champion to be developed, and, um, and that's basically how I got back into training. You know, just sort of haphazardly went back to the gym to train for myself. Very interesting how that those transitions in our lives and where they take us and how we end up in the positions right. that we are. Um, so as you go through that transition into the, becoming the trainer, um, initially it's starting to grow, it's starting to develop. You start working with world champions. I mean, talk to us about that in general. I mean, that's that's pretty impressive. You know, I think one of the first guys that came to me was Lightning Lonnie Smith. I don't know how far you go back, but <laughs> he was a character from the day. And uh, I started working with him and uh, the surgeon. Yeah. But, you know, the funny thing is, not only did it transition me as a trainer, uh, some, of the, some of the uniforms that back in the 90s that you saw here in Vegas, I made most of those uniforms. So I actually learned how to sew to make fight uniforms because I could never find what I like. So I would make me an outfit, and it was so many people, hey, man, I, I got to have that outfit. Where'd you get it? Well, I made it. You uh -huh. want one of these? And believe it or not, I was doing about three or four grand a week just making boxing outfits. Wow. Yeah, from Camacho to, man, you name it, I was making outfits for everybody. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. And um, you see so many now. I think Andre Rozier, trainer out of Brooklyn, uh, trains Danny Jacobs. I want to say he makes his own as well for his fighters. That's interesting. And I know uh, Gaethje's a uh, trainer as well. He, he makes products um, for combat sports in general. I've seen him do that. So. Well, you know, a lot of times when, when we're in the gym working, we design things because we need them. And sometimes when a manufacturer makes things, they're not there with us. And sometimes we make things that we need particularly for what we want to use it for. When you make a general product and you store it to the gym and, you know, everybody use it, but sometimes coaches need a particular device. And the only way to get it, he has to make it himself. So... Uh, and that was sort of like me. I started making the uniforms and, you know, for the things I like. But I think the question was, name some of the fighters. Yeah, I mean, Diego Corrales, I worked with him. Uh, Frankie Lau. Uh, Freddie Norwood, he was WBA featherweight champion. Vince Phillips was the IBF, uh, what was he, junior welterweight champion. Wow. Uh, oh, man, okay. I know I forget half of them. They're gonna be like, you didn't say my name, Kevin Kelly. <laughs> yeah, that's a good uh, name. Sure. Uh, 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 Kit Diamond at the time he was on the rise, but uh, things happened with him. Uh, Stephen the Uh Come on, I know I had to. Come on, it was, it was more. Derek Harmon with Paul Roy Jones, and he's wow. NABF champion. Of course, you know Severn. He was the heavyweight champion. Yep. Uh, uh, man, it's so Long many. List. And I know when I, I know when we hang this thing up, he's go, oh, I forgot about him and that one and that one. <laughs> yeah. So many. <laughs> So, in, in training yeah. these guys, and you're working with them, talk to us about your experiences traveling the world. I mean, I'm pretty sure you ended up in some places that you said, wow. Some people in their lifetime you know, never the funny, even the funny thing about United life, and you, like you say, Like you say, the fun thing about life is, like you said earlier, is, is amazing where we end up and how things sort of transition in our lives. When I left the Army, I think one of my, 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 uh, my soldier friends said to me, so what are you going to do now? I said, well, you know, I think I'm going to just find a job that's going to allow me to travel the world and have fun and do it and get paid. He said, wow, when that happens, call me. And one day I was in Australia thinking like, hey, you know what? I manifested this. A lot of times you don't know how the manifestation is going to end up. Right. You just go with it. It might end up that you're a pilot. 
fly in the world or you're a trainer or you're a boat captain, just go. And, you know, even even the Bible says, just let God. That's what you let, let God do the work and you just follow along. And that's what I did. I just let God do the work. So a lot of times people go, oh, man, you know, your house, you just, you got the grace. Look, I just go through life and enjoy every aspect of it. And I try to treat everybody along the path as the way I like to be treated. And that's sort of why I'm blessed. I, I can attest to that in, in working with you in the USC events. Um, someone that I've known and seen on TV for years, and, and what you see is what you get, and that's not always the case, especially in the fight game. So uh, I want to commend you for well, that And uh, as you're my friend. Um, and I always appreciated the conversations. There's a lot to learn from someone with your vast experience. Um, so I truly do appreciate that. Um, if you want to talk to us about going back to going to school and out after the military, you end up essentially working, you transition to the combat sports world. Talk to us about that transition and how you basically, being a pioneer in the UFC and, and creating the gloves. I mean, that's that's big well, time, man. Exactly. How, talk See, to us about that. <laughs> I went all over well, the place. Okay. All right. So I'm working in, Dana White and I go back 10 years before the UFC. Okay. And we would train. Uh, these top executives here in Las Vegas. You know, Dana White had a Dana White fitness program at a gym. So he had a, a big clientele, a big list of top guys here in Las Vegas. And a lot of them was hotel owners. The Petitas, for example, they, they previous owners of the UFC. So I was using his private gym uh, preparing a fighter, Derek Harmon, for Roy Jones Jr. So I would come in at 6 in the morning, work with the top executives, Frank Petita, Lorenzo, and some of his top staff. And around noon, Derek Harm would show up. So, And I knew Dana was uh, managing boxers, and I didn't know anything about MMA. I didn't even know he managed. I, I didn't know anything about it. So he came to me one day. He said, hey, how would you like to train Tito? So I'm thinking, Tito, are you crazy? Man, that is like one of my biggest idols. My question to him was, how in the hell did you get Tito? <laughs> you know, there's only Tito one Tito, right? <laughs> right, there's only one Tito. He said, uh, he said, well, I got him. He lives in Huntington Beach. I said, Huntington Beach? This kid doesn't even speak English. <laughs> right? Yeah. So I said, what Tito are you talking about? He said, Tito Ortiz. I said, who the hell is Tito Ortiz? Yeah. Right? Right. I'm thinking he's talking Tito Trinidad. Right. I'm thinking I'm going to Puerto Rico for six weeks, eight weeks. Yep. He's talking about Tito Ortiz. I said, who the hell is Tito Ortiz? So he ran upstairs and got a, a VHS tape. I mean, that's right. V, v, I, I would think, I'm going to go over there call now. But <laughs> the tape. He slid it VHS in. Tape. And what I saw was guys kicking, scratching, biting, pulling hair. I said, Dana, what the hell is this? He said, this is going to be the hardest sport in America. I said, this? I said, I don't know. Compared to boxing, Dan, I don't think so. He said, listen, we'll pay you $1,000 a week to go to Huntington Beach to train Tito, teach him striking. I jumped in the car, and that's how I started with me with the UFC. Wow. That's astonishing. That's how I started. Very impressive. And, and the funny thing is, every fight I had about seven, about six guys on, I was training about six guys on the team in striking. And, um, we were still building, still learning, trying to make the sport safe. Because in the beginning, we had shoes on. We took those off because the laces was hurting. People were cutting them up. And um, I always had about six guys on the team. So I would always wrap my guys' his hands. But the, but the opponents start complaining. Say, wait a minute. They have an advantage. So Dan is a house. You got to wrap both sides. Wow. I said, wrap the opponent? Dana. My mind was still stuck in boxing. So I rap both sides. And that's how that started. I started rapping both sides. And um, we had one cut man, Leon Taz, rest his soul, he's dead now. Um, he was the only cut man, and both fighters got cut in a fight. Burt Watson used to run the back room at one time before the UFC, asked me, can I do cuts? Been around it long enough. I've seen the procedure. And I think the first cut I ever received, he had five cuts with Andre Olaski. Never forget it. He was cut up everywhere. 
And that's how I started cut purely accidental. Never even thought about doing cuts. I was I was I was always a trainer, um, a fighter, never a cut man. And that's how my cut man started. Wow. So really a true a test a true testament to being ready when the time comes and just doing it. Just doing it, you know, yeah, going after it and, yeah. and having the right attitude yeah. and putting your effort and energy into something. That's that's that's, that's awesome. And that's true. When opportunity knocks, you just gotta be ready. Answer the door. Most people run from the knock. You know, answer the door. Definitely. So as years went on, um, and like we said earlier, we sort of build things based on our need. The UFC glove was pretty bad. We had a hard time putting the thing on. It was very uncomfortable. So I took a pair home. Uh, from all the experience I had from sewing and designing things, I designed a pair, took it back to Dana White, said, here's our new glove. We loved it, got it patented. We've been using that glove since, I think, UFC 94 or 5 or somewhere there, somewhere around there. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. True pioneer, Mr. Don House. That's yeah. awesome. As we continue today, yeah. um, Don's joining us on the Sunday sit-down series and sharing his story inside and outside the boxing ring and octagon transition from pro or transition, excuse me, from fighter to trainer to UFC cut man. Also developing the gloves. Now we go into another venture. It seems like a never ending uh, story here. Talk to us about you being the president of full throttle boxing. I know we're transitioning now outside of the octagon. We're going back to boxing. Talk to us about Full Throttle Boxing and what it's about. Well, you know, I like to use that word transition. I think everything, every person in life should always have a transitional goal to the next step and your next step. What is your next logical step in life? So I've, I have been a boxer, a trainer, design equipment, cut man. So the next logical step for me is to step into the promotion arena. Now, I have looked around in the boxing industry, and I have compared the boxing industry with the UFC industry, and I noticed there was a big difference, disparity, in, such as fighters and paydays and, and, and how corrupt or not corrupt. You know, UFC is pretty fair. Um, I'm not throwing any names in boxing, how the game works, and sometimes the fight doesn't always go to the winner, and just a lot of crap that goes on. And I want to come up with a. I want to come up with a sport. When I'm talking about the sport, I want to come up with something that was fair for everyone: the promoter, the fighter, the fans. And how do you do that? And 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 if you if you listen to this interview, look around your job and try to figure out how everyone can be happy when when you're doing something. The key to everybody getting paid or everybody's happy at the end of the day. And I think that's what's going on with this whole planet today. It's just trying to find a balance where everybody can get along and just be happy, right? And we all just get along and just and turn this place back to the Eden that it once was. And that's what I want to do with boxing, right? I got a program called Full Throttle Boxing where it starts out of three, three round tournaments, eight fights in one night, and those fighters will win and they will graduate and go to the finale in Las Vegas. The, the purses are fair. Purses are based on your performance, not based on how much the manager can con me and pan a fighter. The fighter has to perform. If a, if a fight is worth fifteen thousand dollars to fight, I divide that by three five thousand dollars a round, and the winner of each round wins eighty percent of that five grand. The loser wins twenty percent of that five grand, and it goes on. If you stop your opponent in whatever round, you win a hundred percent of that round. Uh, I mean eighty percent of that round. And 100% of the, ra- of the rounds, you don't have to fight. So it's fair. And the reason why I came up with that concept is because, you know, I talked to Roy Jones about this plenty of times. Him and Bernard Hopkins were supposed to fight the third time. But they never came to an agreement that who deserves the 60-40 split. Roy Jones thought he deserved it. Bernard Hopkins thought he deserved it. And they left $24 million sitting on the table. Wow. $24 million. So I thought it should have been, each guy gets $6 million a piece. They earn that by name, by right. They have earned the $6 million a piece. And why don't we divide up that $12 million to a million dollars around 80-20 split? Now what type of fight do you think you're going to get at 80-20 split per round? 
and the knockout gets the rest of the money. Definitely, yeah, yeah. See? Big incentive. The, the fight <laughs> determines who wins. The fight determines who deserves the, who, who deserves the big portion of the fight. I like that. Not what I did before. What I'm doing right now. Definitely a different type of concept, yeah. and, and it's going to come to fruition, yeah. and, and we look forward to seeing full throttle boxing go forth. Uh, what are some of your short-term oh, goals and or long-term goals, two-part question, with full throttle boxing? Well, the short term right now is just raising the capital, raising the funds, get, uh, get, getting, getting the awareness out there uh, to let people know that I'm coming on. If, if they decide somebody wants to invest in it at this point, they can always contact me at Don House at Full Throttle Boxing dot com. Long term goals is to give promoters another avenue to choose fighters. So once I build a fighter up, I don't want to sign them. I just want to pass them on to build them back up. The long term goal is to get these B fighters that never had a chance. Boxing boxing don't know what to do with a guy with a record of eighteen and four. UFC know exactly what to do with a fighter eighteen and four. Fight them. <laughs> Boxing, we don't do that. That guy, you lose a fight in boxing, that's it, you're, you're done. You can be 25 and over, 25 knockouts, lose one fight. You're done. Crazy. That's boxing. But I want to give these guys a second chance so other promoters can pick them up and keep promoting these guys. So I'm sort of a platform that would, um, uh, uh, a pool for, for promoters to choose from, to pick from. Very interesting, and it's gonna, it's definitely going to be a game changer as uh, we move forward and, and see and going into these new and unknown times. I mean, we're gonna, it's gonna be interesting, and I, and I look forward to that. Yeah, it's a great concept, and uh, I'm glad you're able to share that with us. Um, truly, a pioneer, and that's something else that's very different. Um, and what we don't yeah. see enough of is, like you said, uh, a Tevin Farmer comes to mind, a guy that fought, lost three or four fights very early on in the career, and you're almost a castaway. Um, yeah, he's done. Yeah, and that's unfortunate. Uh, he's able to recover and have a great career thereafter, and you don't see that enough. And I'm glad to see no. that. And, and this platform will allow um, guys in his position, there's a lot of them, to continue to get to where they want to go and not be a castaway. So that's awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. Give everybody a fair chance to, you know, give them a second chance to say, hey, look, like you said, I lost two fights in the beginning of my career, and uh, now I, here's a platform where I have a second chance. That's all it is, just a second chance. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. And, Don, as we talk about your career and the, and the different areas you've worked in and all your accomplishments, what would you say is is been your greatest experience in your career in the combat sports world? Man, uh, great top experience. three? Our greatest accomplishment. You know, I, 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 all of it, everything, even the smallest little thing, just just hanging out with some of the guys, some of, some of the fighters from the from from the from the guy that's starting out to the top dog. I mean, I look at everything that I do as a great experience. So this, you know, just being in my backyard sometime is a great experience. I don't, you know, it's not like oh well, this was awesome because once everything becomes awesome, your life becomes awesome. You know, um, to me, I, you know, people stop me sometimes and say, oh, man, do you know you are? I go, well, no, who am I? <laughs> I guess I haven't, it haven't hit me like that. I'm just a regular old guy that's out doing what I love doing. So yeah. it always shocks me that people go, whoa, you know, you're a bad house. And, well, you know, it's funny because all my life, people thought I was Sugar Ray Leonard. They always, hey, you're Ray Leonard, you're Ray Leonard. So I'm walking through the airport in New York. And the guy chased me down for an autograph. So I pull him to the side and say, listen, I know you think I'm Sugar Ray Leonard, but I'm not. Right? I get it all the time. He said, no, you're Don House. You're see, You did this and you did that. And I'm like, holy crap, I finally arrived. <laughs> but I just see me as me. I don't, I don't see the I'm, – I'm just a human like just a regular old guy. Just do what I love doing. You know, and it's always funny to me when you, know, you get guys say, well, I didn't get an Oscar. For the role that I did. Well, did you get paid for it? Well, yeah, well, be happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? yeah and, and I enjoy what I do, and I get paid for it, so how can I not not be happy, you know? Right, and success is, is what you make it. I mean, I think a lot of times, yeah, absolutely. you know, people, 
they think they've failed and you don't have to accept failure. You adjust to it. We're all going to fail in something and we're all going to be in successful in something. To. So that's great, how we uh, grow mindset. Definitely the positive attitude there. That's how we grow. Yeah. And as we wrap up in a, in a few here today, talk to us Don, about your passions and interests outside of the combat sports world. What are some things you like to do during your free time? What are you passionate about? Oh man, my passion, my, my major, major passion is, Oh man, free energy. That's my major passion. I mean, I am a Tesla. That Tesla is like my hero. Unfortunately, the planet, well, I wouldn't say the planet, the planet loved Tesla. I, unfortunately, the powers that be that didn't love Tesla. And a lot of his projects was put up under the rug. I, I believe that God gave us all this energy for free not to charge us for it, not to pay us for it. Cars that were run unlimited, homes that were run unlimited, and all those devices out there just swept down the road. So that's my passion. I'm always designing different generators. You know, my, my degree is in engineering. I'm always right. designing different generators and just trying to find that right perpetual motion device. That's my true passion outside of what I do all day. So my garage, man, you go in that place, man, don't touch things. You don't know what they are. <laughs> so that's my outside passion. Wow, that's very energy. very interesting. Um, and that could tie in, and we always do fast facts on the Sunday sit-down series. Maybe it ties into something most people don't know about you. They see Don House on TV, cut man, boxing trainer. What would you say oh. is something that most people don't know about you? Uh, wow, what do they don't know about me? Uh, well, let me see. Uh, that's a good one. I mean, I'm sort of like, I throw it all out there, you know? Yeah. yeah. Oh, hey, maybe... Oh, well, maybe, maybe. Yeah, let me see. Well, I don't know. You know, I'll do a little stand-up on the side. I've done that around town a few times, so but that's just for fun, though. So, you know, I, I think I did it on a dare. Uh, um, I was with my cousin and a couple of their friends, and, and they always wanted to do that. I said, just grab the mic and go up. They never did it, so I did it. And before I know it, I was having fun. That's so awesome. I guess doing a little stand-up, I guess, I guess that's a little bit thing most people don't know. <laughs> I think fighters do because, you know, most of the guys that, the UFC that I rap hands, they, I get them so far off thinking of the fight. I just go back and give them a whole standard routine, and they, they just love it because they get to laugh and enjoy themselves. And, and before they get, you know, we know what a fighter comes to do. You got to come to fight. So I right. get his mind off of that. So I tell them some jokes. I keep the whole team laughing, and they enjoy it. So that's probably why I'm so popular with these guys in the UFC. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, this guy keeps me laughing. You know, so I think – that helps a lot for a fighter. So that's probably why uh, I'm most probably, well, uh, man, my, mind, my, my mind and brain is going faster than my mouth. Uh, so I guess that would be it. Interesting. Yeah. And I've seen you in action and working with the various fighters and, and that mindset before a fight uh, to bring a different um, mindset. That's right. You and I work room. together for yeah. two fights. Yeah, 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 yeah. Awesome, man. That's right. Awesome. Yeah. So who would you say is your favorite fighter of all time? favorite fighter of all time. Give me a top three if you want. That makes it a little easier. You know, I'm the, I'm the guy that, I like the underdog guys. I like the guys, you know, we all like the, the Leonard's and the Robinson's and then, you know, all the, we, we like all those top guys. Right. But I'm, I'm an underdog type of guy, you know. It, it, okay, if I, if I go to MMA, uh, one of my favorite fighters in MMA is, believe it or not, it's actually Don Cerrone. I mean, he comes to fight Guys like him, uh, uh, what's the guy out of Illinois with the crazy hair? Uh, he's going to kill me now because I can't remember his name. Um, Clay Guida. Guys like oh, that. Yeah, I yeah, love yeah. those guys. You know what yeah. I mean? Donald Cerrone, Clay Guida. Those guys come to fight. Win or lose, yeah. they come to fight. Now, you know, we're going to love the guys like uh, all the top guys, Silvers and those guys. You know, they fight well and, and their right. fans get behind them. I just like the under, I just like the underdogs and the bulldogs. Hence, probably why I'm attracted to doing full throttle. So I want all the underdogs to raise up. Yeah, but I'm an underdog guy. You know, I'm not I'm not the mainstream media. Hey, this is Ray Leonard. This is you know Ali. You know those, those guys getting what they get. So I'm like I like the underdogs. You know, I like that. I like that. Very interesting. Uh, Smiley Sam comes to mind. The guy that's been around for a long time. Able to work with him in Jacksonville. Um, UFC 249 yeah. there and kind of guy it's under the radar and we know him because of his personality but a gamer man 
like a guy like Clay Guido, yeah. like you said, those guys are gamers. They come to fight. Come to fight. Win or lose. And come you know, I, I want as we continue to expand on the combat sports side with your experience, I, I didn't really chime in too much on as you train going back earlier with Tito, a guy like that, and really, what did you learn from those experiences? going back and forth between boxing and MMA, what would you say is the biggest thing you learned well, between kind of hopping back and forth between both, you know, sports? Well, I, the funny thing, one thing I did notice, there's two different breeds of individuals. Uh, when I first got into MMA, I was, I was working with Tito. Well, actually, team punishment, not just Tito himself. I mean, whole damn team punishment. I was teaching him all the strikes. And I noticed those guys got along. They would work and train each other and then fight each other Saturday night, beat the crap out of each other, and they get along. Boxers don't do that. Boxers don't want to be in the same state with their opponent until fight night. You know, I'm like, wait a minute, this is a different breed of characters. These guys actually, it, it's changed a little bit now. I mean, you know, I think Teams. the barking at each other now sells right. more tickets. But in that beginning, they all got along. They all trained together. They worked together. They all gave each other advice, and they fought each other. Boxers never did that. That was the Julian one Ryan. thing. No, I don't want you to see me train. I don't want you to watch my videos. I don't, you know, I was boxers. Those are different, different class of people. Just. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, I was curious as far as the dynamic between the two, and, and obviously you have vast experience in both, so it's very interesting. And I, right. I can, I think even now you see guys if someone beats the other guy in MMA. May go train with them. I don't think you're going to see that in boxing. So I definitely no, can see the correlation. No, no, very, very seldom you would see that. You know, you would see that very seldom, very seldom. Yeah, As we I mean, I did get a call from. Uh, uh, I did get a call from Wilder's team, but we'll see how that works out. You know, since he actually beat my guy twice, but so they kind of gave me a call. We'll see how that works out. That's kind of where I left that. So we'll see where it works out. Interesting, yeah. yeah it's uh, you got that bass background, man. I'm looking forward. If if you were in the corner with him, that would yeah. be uh, interesting. And you also yeah, work you work with Caleb Plant as well. Currently, oh, see, there you go. That's another one. You're right. That's another one. Great guy. This guy has a lot of tools. I love that guy. He's probably one of the hardest. <laughs> I've seen three of the hardest workout guys on the planet: Floyd wow. Mayweather Jr., Roy Jones. And Kate Plant. Wow. These guys work out like there's no tomorrow. I'm sure there's more of my experience from what I've seen. That's high praise for sure. This guy works out like a machine. He works like a machine. And I told him, I said, I already found his opponent that's going to beat him. He's that little nine year old kid right now that's aspiring to be a middleweight champion. I said, until that kid grows up, Caleb, you're going to run the division. He works. <laughs> wow. This kid respects the sport, he respects his family. He's a good-hearted kid. I can't say any, I can't say anything great about bad about this kid. This kid does everything the right way. He uh, works hard. Impressive, uh, Don. You're all over the place, man. And I might have to write a book yeah. one day. I think we're gonna get there. Yeah, so. I, guess I forgot about Caleb Plant. I guess probably so Caleb, many. It's so, it's so many. <laughs> right. Wow. <laughs> so as we wrap up. What would you share with the youth or anybody interested in combat sports, whether it's MMA, whether it's boxing? What's your message to them? Well, my message is whatever you're interested in, I don't care what it is. If it's, if it's basket weaving, we used to always say out here at the university, I went to university. If it's basket weaving, be the best. Come from your heart. There's more brain cells in your heart than it is in your brain. You know, you know how people say, well, which shoe looks better on me, this one or that one? Your heart already knows. Follow your heart. Once you follow your heart, you cannot go wrong. I don't care what it is. Success is success. It might not be LeBron James' success or um, some other top-ranked singer or dancer. Everybody has a certain amount of success, and success is success no matter what it looks like. If you enjoy what you're doing and, and, and if it's about the money, it's going to show up anyway. Don't worry about the money. Do things from the heart. Once you do it from the heart, the money shows up anyway. Wow, powerful stuff. Don House, thank you so much for joining us today on the Sunday Sit Down Series. I'm Eddie Ramos. It's a pleasure to hear your story thank you. inside, outside the octagon, outside, inside the boxing ring. 
truly appreciate your Thank time. You. Thank you for joining us, Don. And trust me, Eddie, it was a great, it was always great working with you. Um, I'm, I'm, I wish we and Dana's here. We got to get back to Florida. Uh, Florida is great. Dana, we got to get back there as much as we can. Great weather, great food, great people. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you and I had a chance to meet and work together. Uh, call me anytime you want, man, for anything. I'm here. So, truly an honor. The door's open. Truly an honor to call you my friend and, and work alongside you and learn as well. So, thank you so much, Don. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye bye.